Greetings to you and welcome to session 34 of John's Gospel. I'm Timothy Muse, lead pastor here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Alliance, Ohio. It's a joy to be with you today as we spend this time together. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for investing. I always say, you know, time is our greatest commodity. Time is much more precious than our money or our uh, abilities to draw resources. So the fact that you're listening to this, that you're signing into this, that you're even if you're doing something else while this is happening, even if you're working out or working in the garden or whatever, I, I don't I take no umbrage to that. I'm actually very blessed that you decide to be part of uh, to, to let this be part of your time. So thank you for that. Thank you for for um, your love and your support and your grace. And thank you for being part of this. I do hope and pray that that these sessions are meaningful to you, that not only you're able to look into what God is doing through the scriptures in the gospel of John, but also what God is doing in our own lives and, and how we can apply this. Now, I, I, I think it's really important for us to grasp that scripture is not a closed document. It is still open. It is still alive. It is still spiritual speaking, and it is still proclaiming. We want to see the scriptures as still proclaiming the truth of God to those around us. Scriptures is not a closed document. It is not dead. It is alive, and we want to celebrate it as alive. So so every time we read the scriptures, every time we come into the scriptures, we come in with a different, you know, a, a different view, because we're different. We're different as people. So I hope that this is a time that that you feel connected and spoken to. I hope that this is a time that you feel that God's grace is alive and that the, the scriptures can help direct your life. That's the that's the whole point of doing these these sessions. That's the whole point of bringing the gospel forward is to to make sure that that the word is exposed and that people feel the love and the grace. So so thank you. Thank you for that. If this is your first time, then welcome aboard. I hope that uh, that it's meaningful for you. I definitely would recommend going back and listening to the other ones because there's a lot of great information that's, that's back in the previous episodes. We have been walking through uh, the Gospel of John from the beginning to now. Uh, so definitely check them out. But you don't have to stop in this one. You don't have to go back and and listen to other ones, you know, you can keep, keep trudging along and uh, you'll find uh, a lot of good stuff here already, uh, you know, in, in place and in sight. So, so definitely check it out, check it out. Keep going. Thank you for tuning in. If you've been following along, welcome back. It's great to have you back. I certainly do appreciate you uh, being able to bring, being able to be here and, and following on this this text. So, uh, if you are, if you're, if you're connecting with this through social media, which most likely you are, either through Facebook or through Instagram, Twitter, or even if you're connecting through the website, I would encourage you to share it. Share along with it. Get it out there. Share it so that other people can follow along. It's, uh, it's the way that we're able to get this information out there. It's the way that we're able to share the gospel. You know, we're so blessed with social media because we can do. Uh, we can share this stuff out here without even really getting out of bed, without even really t- talking to anybody. I mean, you just push share, boom, and it's out there. It's done. You're growing. You're learning. So, so as awesome as that is, as awesome as that is, I certainly would encourage you to share this out there, get it out there so that others can follow along, so that others can connect with it. Uh, this is not proprietary information, so get it out there. Uh, help people out. Uh, if you know someone directly that could benefit from them, from this, then DM them, email it to them, get it out there directly, what, whatever, what, whatever you feel or however you feel that it's going to work out, you know, definitely do it. And um, it'd be awesome. It'd be awesome for you to, you know, to, to really, to really get it out there and be part of the growth of what we're trying to do. So share it out there if you can and, and, and help things, uh, you know, help things move forward. So thanks for being part of this. Thanks for signing on, listening up. Uh, I would recommend you have a Bible open before you. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a digital or paper printed or typed, however it is, uh, but have a Bible open before you having the Bible open certainly helps for you to be able to read, you know, the words themselves. So you're not just, you know, thinking that maybe it's what it says, but you can actually see the words that are there. Uh, it can be a paraphrase translation. Doesn't doesn't matter on my end. Uh, translation is far more. It's more accurate in the 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 Greek or the Hebrew into the English. That's what a translation is. Uh, but it's a little bit more cumbersome. 
So if you're reading for, uh, if you're reading more for detail, then of course a translation is better. But if you're reading for entrance, if you want to enter into it more easily, more fully, then definitely a paraphrase because a paraphrase is going to speak more fluently. It's a little easier to read. So, so how, however you choose to connect into it, um, whether it is a paraphrase or a, a translation, I certainly would would encourage you to uh, have a Bible open before you so that you can follow along, so that you can follow along and. And be part of, of what's going on. So th- so there you have it. Um, like I said, it can be it can be digital. It could be um, uh, you know your Bible, whatever whatever you choose to do. So uh, so we're in the Gospel of John. Like I said at the beginning, John is the fourth book in the New Testament. Bible's divided up into the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, each book is divided up then into chapter and verse. Uh, so un- understand this to be true. I know I've said some of this before, but the Bible didn't just like drop out of heaven. The Bible was put together by people. Uh, These words, these texts, these ideas, these books were all gathered together and they were canonized, as it's called, uh, made holy and set apart um, from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, So what we have here, John is the fourth book of the New Testament. John is the third, uh, is the, the fourth gospel. So there's the three Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, and then John. So that's where we're at, and we're in the we're in the eleventh chapter of of John. So we're about halfway through, halfway through the book, and I know it's only taken us thirty weeks to do it. So, and I ought to tell you something about where we're at and about where we're going, about what we're trying to do. I really want to dig deep. I, I've said many times, you know, th- there's no there's no end to this. We're not looking to end. We're not. We're on a journey, not a destination. So the more we journey, the more we dig. It's it's all good. Uh, I don't I, I don't have an issue with taking as, this long in order to get through it. I think it's a great idea. So we're in chapter 11. This is the re, the, res, the raising of Lazarus, the story of the raising of Lazarus. And we just we just got done. So we just got to verse 44 where Jesus calls Lazarus out of the tomb and Lazarus comes out. You know, his his hands and his feet wrapped in linen cloth and his head and his face is covered in a, in a facial cloth. Again, and, and much like we're going to see in the resurrection when Jesus rises from the dead, that we're going to see, you know, those linens and the importance of those linens. So so Lazarus, you know, you know, and it says, you know, the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. You know, now understand that, that not only was Lazarus dead, but he was dead for days, four days he was in the tomb. So that means he was dead at least five days. And usually in the Jewish ritual and tradition, they try to get someone in the grave within 24 hours because they don't embalm. They don't draw, drain out any of the bodily fluids or anything. So they just... So, so it's a it's a very quick process because the body very quickly starts to decay, starts to um, decompose, and so they want to quickly get him in the tomb. So Lazarus was in the tomb five; he was dead five days. He was in the tomb four days, um, enough so that there was already a stench. So the idea of Lazarus kind of like hiding out in the tomb uh, that's that's what we're trying to avoid here. There was no there's no trickery here. This isn't a magic trick or this isn't a sleight of hand. Lazarus was dead, dead and done and gone. And uh, Jesus reached through the veil, pulled him back to the living, restored his body to wholeness and brought him out of the grave. And remember what we heard at the beginning. It's not just that Lazarus, he, he didn't just like have a stroke or a heart attack or fall down a cliff and die. He had been sick before uh, he died. So he was he was ill, uh, most likely for a, 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 sh- a period of time, maybe not a long period of time, but a period of time nonetheless. So Lazarus was ill. He was sick. And then he died. So then in being raised from the dead that we see here in the gospel, it's not just that he was like life was breathed back into him. OK, so he's now he's like laying on the on the on the beer in the uh, in the um, uh, in the grave, in the tomb, uh, breathing. No, he walks out. So not only is he brought back to life, but he is healed. He is made whole. He is made complete. So Jesus didn't just raise him from the dead. Jesus healed him from his illness. So he walks back out of the tomb. We have to assume or conclude that Lazarus did not, that Lazarus did not um, just fall over dead. He was sick and he probably was somewhat immobile, if not completely immobile before his death. So so Lazarus is, is back from the dead and he is well, he is whole. This is a huge and monumental thing. 
All right, so here we are, um, chapter 11, verses 45 and following. I uh, get my glasses on here. I know you're, this, this is, a, this is a, an audio. You're not really seeing me, but I get my glasses on here. So this is uh, chapter 11, verse 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary, had seen what Jesus did and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what he had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the council and said, What are we to do? This man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. You do not understand that it is better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. He did not say this on his own, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was about to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but to gather into one the dispersed children of God. So from that day on, they planned to put him to death. All right, so you can imagine how this statement works. I mean, you can imagine how this works out. Here are people, they've come to Mary to weep with her. Uh, again, maybe they're friends, maybe they're paid, maybe they're just professionals. They're there weeping. So Mary is weeping, and um, the Jews are weeping with her. These are the Jews that would have gone with her when they thought, you know, she was going out to the tomb. Well, they all knew that Lazarus was dead. There was no question. Lazarus was dead, okay? There was no question about whether he was alive or not. There was no question about his livelihood or about what's going on. He was dead. And that was to be believed, that he was dead. He was dead. He was gone. He was done. That was it. Um, And I don't want to sound so crass, but it needs to be said. We cannot for a moment give any kind of credence or idea that maybe Lazarus was just really, really sick. All right? I mean, there are some traditions, there are some, there are stories um, that that come out of uh, some, some, um, you know, voodoo practices and stuff that, that there is a, a powder or a potion that can render someone almost dead. I mean, they, it looks like they're, they're dead uh, for like 12 hours or 14 hours. There's stories of this. Now, I've, I've never seen it. I'm not going to say that it's true, but there are stories. And, and these stories go back you know, generations, hundreds of years. So, so it could be that maybe Lazarus was tricking. Maybe this was a trick, a sleight of hand. Uh, that maybe you know that Lazarus really wasn't as sick as everybody thought he was, and they stocked the tomb, and you know, and he's been in there hiding for four days, and it's one big ruse for Jesus. No, those who came with Mary to the tomb, they knew that Lazarus was dead. So anything that happens is definitely supernatural. Anything that happens is definitely big. And so here is Lazarus coming out of the tomb. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary had, and had seen what, what Jesus did, believed in him. So this was a moment of belief. Okay, this was a moment of belief for uh, the people. This was a moment of belief. Jesus has just put on a very huge God display. Jesus has just shown a very huge God display uh, in front of the people. And many believed in him. Many believed that he had done something incredible, godlike, so much so that they believed in him, that they started to follow him. That's what it means to believe in him is to follow him. So there are many who believe. They believe. They accept this. This is this is God. This is God work here. You know, there's magicians that do magical stuff and there's people that, you know, do sleight of hand stuff, but this is God work. Calling back someone who's dead to life, that doesn't happen. Remember what the blind man said, you know, never in history has somebody who was born blind been given their sight. Well, never in history is there any documentation someone being dead 4 days is being brought back to life. Okay, at least four days, four days in the tomb. So who knows how much longer that Lazarus is dead? Again, I I think it was another day. So four days in the tomb. So dead five days. And here he is back to life. So this not happened. So people start to believe. But others, but others, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Now, this doesn't mean this doesn't mean that they didn't believe. They just went and told the Pharisees, they told the higher ups, they told those in command what Jesus had done. They witnessed to the Pharisees. Maybe, maybe they were, they were telling it. So the Pharisees had finally get off of Jesus um, tail. 
You know, it's been clear for a while that the Pharisees and scribes have been trying to kill him. So maybe, maybe that they were telling them this to get to, to let them to let G, to to get off of Jesus' tail, to get off of Jesus' case. Um, I'd say something else, but you can fill in the blank. Maybe they were saying this to encourage the Pharisees and the scribes to back off. That this guy actually is who he says he is. This guy actually is who he claims to be. So, so here we have this. Um, so the chief priests and the Pharisees call a meeting of the council and they say, what are we to do? This man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. Okay, so, so here's the Pharisees and the scribes. Now, and their concern is legitimate. They're not just concerned about their holy place and their nation. They're also concerned about their power um, and their status. But their concern is legitimate. If the Romans find out that there's a God man proclaiming, and if the Romans find out that the people are starting to follow this God man and starting to generate some kind of, of undercurrent, the Romans will come in and squash everything. The Romans do not like the idea of someone questioning their power. The Romans do not like the idea of someone coming along and acting and, and acting like the leader of an uprising. You know, I've said before, the Romans, uh, you know, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse is, is internal strife. The Romans are terrified of rebellion, of strife from within. So they, they would see Jesus as a threat. And they're not going to, they're, they're, the, the Romans don't uh, send assassins, okay? They send hordes. The Romans don't care. You know, they're not going to come in and, and cherry pick Jesus. They're going to come in and take out everybody. And they'll destroy the holy place and they'll destroy everything. You know, their concern is legitimate. Their concern is real. And it is, uh, and it has been seen before. That's how, that's, that's Pax Romano. That's the peace of Rome. It's done at the tip of a sword. You understand that if you challenge Rome, they're going to come in and they're going to wipe you out. They're just going to destroy you. They're not going to take any gruff or fuss or anything. They're just going to come in and destroy you. That's how it works. So, so their concern is legitimate. It really is. It's legitimate that they're concerned about their holy place and their nation, but they're also concerned about their own power and their own greed. So, so it's all, I mean, it, it, some of it's veiled, some of it is, some of it isn't, but that's what they're concerned about. Their, their concern is legitimate. But it is also, it's only partially legitimate. It's not completely legitimate. They're not completely concerned about that. They're only partially concerned about that. So, so they make this claim, this statement. What do we, if people, if he keeps doing this, then people are going to start believing him. They're going to start following him. Like, duh. I mean, that was probably the case that they were concerned about before. And now they've moved from this guy's the, the devil to, oh, oh, my goodness, we can't contain him. We can't control him. So we need to figure out what to do because the Romans will come in and will destroy this place, destroy us all, and we'll lose everything. We need to, we need to do something to stop him. And they've been trying to delegitimize him. They've been trying to demonize him. Uh, they've been trying to arrest him, but then Caiaphas rolls up. Now, Ca this is the first we've heard the name Caiaphas, uh, and and Caiaphas is the high priest at the time. He is the one that has been elected for the year to oversee um, the the work of uh, of the of the temple, the work of the temple cult, the work of the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and the council. See, every year, someone from the priestly class would be elevated to high priest. And, and that, that is basically the one who oversees the priestly class and oversees the temple. It's not something that, that, you, know, that, you, that you earn or what have you, per se. It, it is truly an election of the priest to choose someone to serve in that position for the year. And though it is a position of honor, it's not always a position of honor because if something goes wrong, it's on the high priest. Uh, to have to face it. So so Caiaphas is the high priest this year, and we're going to see him come back later when they arrest Jesus in a little bit. But he says, he says to the Sanhedrin, he says to the council, you know nothing. You know nothing at all. You do not understand that it is better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation be destroyed. So Caiaphas is arguing for the execution of Jesus. He is arguing that Jesus' death though unfortunate and 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 not desired is the best for the nation he's arguing that it is better for jesus to be put to death than for the nation to suffer 
one person to die versus the nation suffering. And I think in a lot of ways, you know, in modern times, you know, we talk about political assassination and the such. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Uh, but it really does challenge the, the benefit of life in all people. And again, you know, understand, you know, these were Jews. They, they knew the law. They knew what it meant to kill and not to kill. So, you know, to acknowledge this, to admit this, this is pretty big stuff. This is pretty, uh, pretty intense stuff to to admit, to say that it's better for one person to die than for the nation to suffer. He said this. Now, he did not say this on his own, the scriptures tell us, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was about to die for the nation and not for the nation only, but to gather into one the dispersed children of God. So from that day on, they planned to put him to death. So, you know, it's really important when we see this. And, and, and this is really, you know, this is something that, that we've struggled with. Uh, Luther, in his writings, uh, Luther was very anti-Semitic because, you know, he blamed the Jews for killing Jesus. Um, that was, I mean, that was an outright claim. And, and not just him only. A lot of the Protestant reformers in the early time did that. But when we dig into here to this theological reality, the first thing we need to acknowledge is the fact that it was Jesus died at the hands of the Romans, not the Jews. It was Pilate, and we'll see that later on down the road. It was the Romans that executed him, not the Jews. The Jews didn't execute him. They pushed for it. They called out for it. They wanted it. But it was the Romans who did it. But it was not devised within the Jewish schema to execute him. It was actually devised by God. It was God. So Caiaphas, he doesn't say this on his own, but he has he prophesied. He had a prophecy. He had what would be considered an unconscious prophecy. Um, and, and, and this is a, 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 a you know, a, a, like a dream state. All right. Uh, something deep. But he had this unconscious prophecy. He saw that Jesus was going to die for the people and not just for the people, but for the whole nation to gather into the dispersed children of God. So Caiaphas is let in on, on what God wants. Okay, So God is, is prophesying through Caiaphas. So we want to say that, that, you know, that Caiaphas and, and Annas and Caiaphas and the Sadducees and the, and the Pharisees, though they are driven by greed and power, they are still listening to the call of God. And the call of God is to execute Jesus. That's the point. Jesus' execution is coming from, you know, from God. Jesus has to die. And this is really the point where we need to start talking about this because it's going to come up. Jesus has to die. There's no way around this. And the only way that Jesus, as the Son of God, is going to die is if God ordains it and executes it. Now, God is going to use uh, human functionaries. God is going to use the Jews and the, and the Romans, and God is going to use Judas. But this is all at God's hand. This is all at God's ordaining. And Caiaphas, as the high priest, as the one who should be, and, and sounds like at least to some degree is paying attention, he receives this prophecy that this is what God wants. He receives the prophecy that Jesus is going to die, and not just for the nations, but for the world. So, so, so Caiaphas sees the greater redemptive reality within the death of Jesus. Caiaphas sees that Jesus' death is going to be something far more important than just some rabble rouser who's going to be put to death. Uh, Caiaphas sees that Jesus' death will be reconciliatory that he will reconcile to himself and to others a far greater portion of people. This is an important death. Jesus' death is an important death. And so we need to see that. We need to grasp it. And we need to see that the plot to execute Jesus for this. Now, before they tried to kill him, it was just because they wanted to shut him up. But now Caiaphas sees Jesus' death as something far more important than just trying to shut him up. His death will be for the good of the nation. His death will be for the good of the world. That's what the death of Jesus will bring about. And that's what Caiaphas is arguing for and setting forth his reality to. So, so Caiaphas, as the high priest, should be the one to say, no, 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 we're not going to talk of death. But he actually is the one that saw, that had the prophecy that Jesus' death was going to bring about the, the redemption of the nation. So from that day forward, they planned to put him to death. They planned it. 
it was now becoming a, a plan, a, a, a path. Before it was, hey, if we can catch this guy in a trap, let's do it and get rid of him. Now the plans are being laid. Now something nefarious and something malevolent is in the works to destroy Jesus because that's what the Pharisees want because they're afraid that they're going to lose their power. They're afraid that they're going to lose the temple and the nation. So they are working diligently to try to plan a way to execute Jesus. So this is very straightforward and God is not stopping them. You know, if, if God wanted to stop them, God could. I mean, Caiaphas could have a heart attack or a stroke or be eaten by a lion. And the whole Sanhedrin could be wiped out by plague or, or we've seen it, boils or frogs. But God is not stopping them. God is not trying to stop them. God is doing the work, uh, allowing the work to come forward. God is allowing for Jesus to be executed. God's allowing it to happen uh, without, you know, without interference, without mitigation. God is allowing it to happen. And this is a thing that... Um, you know, that, that, that a lot of people trip on. A lot of people want to think that Jesus got caught up in some malevolent task. No, no, this was God. God allowed it to happen. God said, I'm, I'm going to be okay with it. I'm going to allow it to happen. I'm going to allow my son to die. He needs to die for the nations and to gather into one, the dispersed children of God. So this has, you know, this is kind of a very deep theological statement about the power of Christ's death and resurrection, about why Christ died and rose from the dead. That's what we're seeing here. Caiaphas gives us a, a, a um, theological statement. All right, so verse, verse 54, therefore Jesus no longer walked about openly among the Jews. He went from there to a town called Ephraim in the region near the wilderness, and he remained there with his disciples. So it became clear now that Jesus was a marked man. It became clear now after Lazarus' resurrection that Jesus had revealed something that other people aren't going to find very important or very good. So again, and, and it's not that Jesus is being a coward, okay? We don't want to see this as cowardly in the eyes of of, pe- of of Jesus, but Jesus' time hadn't come yet. It's not ready yet. There's still a few things that need to be done. So Jesus is being smart about where he's hanging out so that he doesn't find himself um, arrested prematurely, so that he doesn't find himself arrested before things are accomplished. There is far more at play here than just Jesus doing, um, you know, a few things here and there. Jesus is doing the work of God, and he is doing it in such a way that it is taking a great deal of interaction and a great deal of work. So we want to make sure that, that we're seeing that God is is intimately involved in this, that God is intimately involved in everything that's taking place. Uh, so that's where it is right now with this. That's where Jesus is uh, is at. So we definitely want to make sure that we see um, we see this happening. And now Jesus can't go about from place to place. He's 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 not in hiding, if you will, but he is very protective about his movements. Because he still has work to do. He still has things left to do before it's time for him to go to um, to the cross. And that's going to be the ultimate goal. All right, so verse 55 and following. Now the, Pharisee, now the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and were asking one another as they stood in the temple. What do you think? Surely he will not come to the festival, will he? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who knew where Jesus was should let them know so that they might arrest him. So, you know, it's kind of funny because I, I, I see this kind of like an ancient law and order episode, you know. Um, the festival of the Jews was near. Obviously, people are coming from all over town. It's, it's like, you know, the Super Bowl or, or some kind of grand event. And, and Jesus' word is, is, is spreading. So people are going to wonder if he's going to be there. Is Jesus going to show up? Is the guy here? Is he, is he going to be part of the festival? Of course, one would think, you know, of course he's going to be part of the festival. Of course he's going to be here. And then others would think, well, that'd be pretty stupid of him to show up, wouldn't it? Because, you know, he doesn't want to get arrested. He doesn't want to get executed. 
So, so there's a lot of question, a lot of, 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 of back and forth. Is he going to show up? Is he going to be here? Isn't he going to be here? And really, the other aspect is, do we even know what he looks like? <laughs> you know, most people don't. I don't want to sound, you know, like, a, I mean, I, I don't want to sound racist, and it's not meant to sound racist, but Jesus was a, was a, a 30-something Arab man. I mean, he didn't have a halo over his head. I um, mean, he's not going to show up in a Cadillac. So he's going to look like just about every other 30-something Arab man at the time. So most people didn't know what Jesus looked like. I mean, there wasn't the facial recognition like we have today with television and other media forms. So people didn't know. They didn't know if he was going to show up. They didn't even know what he looked like. They were looking. They were hoping. They wanted a glimpse of this Jesus fellow. They wanted a glimpse of the power that he brings. So now the Pharisees and the scribes and the chief priests, I mean, they've, they put out orders that anyone who knew where Jesus was should let them know. Jesus was a wanted man now. I mean, his name, his, his face was up in, uh, in the post office. He was a wanted man. He was probably number one on the chief priests and the, and the Pharisees' top ten most wanted list. They wanted him. They wanted to arrest him. They wanted to uh, try him. They wanted to execute him. They wanted him so that they could prove that they were still in control. They didn't like the idea that their, their control was going to be questioned. They wanted to prove that they were still in control. So they wanted Jesus to be arrested so that they could say, hey, look, we got him. We got this guy. He's here. You know, we, we, got, we, we got him. Thank you. We're in control. You don't have to worry about sending any garrisons or anything like that. We have our house in order. Jesus running around means that their house is not in order. And that's a problem, especially when it comes to the Romans. So they wanted to arrest him. They wanted to say, we got our guy. Um, and so they, they told anybody, look, if you know where Jesus is, you let us know. We'll go arrest him. You let us know where he's at. We want to know where he's at. They're looking for him. Okay. Uh, they want to arrest him because they want to be able to prove that they're still in control. Uh, Jesus is now amped up the 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 situation, and it's gonna it's gonna come to a head. It's gonna come to a head here very soon because um, because it has to. It's gonna come to a head when Jesus is executed. Uh, and that's what we're going to enter into. This is a time when we see a shift in the writing of the gospel. We're going to move. Jesus is going to move for something far different. This is really, in a lot of ways, the end of Jesus' public ministry until he goes to uh, to the cross. I mean, he's going to spend the next, what we would know as few chapters, uh, with his disciples teaching and praying and speaking. But but we're at a place now where, where he's a wanted man. And, and again, everything, Jesus is not going to get tripped up. He will get arrested when it's time for him to get arrested. He is not going to get tripped up and allow someone to, to trick him. There is no trick here, folks. There is no, uh, there is no Jesus um, didn't get it right. No, no, he, he, he got it right. This is Jesus doing what Jesus does. There is no trick here in this. Jesus will be arrested when it's time for him to be arrested. And he will give over when it's time for him to give over and not before. So we want to make sure that we don't think that the Pharisees are in control, even if they want to. They're not. Jesus is in control. God is in control. It's always the way it is. So Jesus is hanging out at the right place and the right time until it's time for him to be arrested. And when it's time for him to be arrested, he will step up and will be arrested. But there's far more that he has to do that isn't going to get done if he finds himself in prison. So we see kind of the end of Jesus' public ministry until he gets to uh, Jerusalem and the night in the Garden of Eden when the crowd shows up. For now, he's going to kind of hunker in with his disciples. He's going to teach them and us a lot of stuff that we have yet to cover and that we will get into. So, my friends, I'm going to leave it here. I know it's a little shorter episode than I'm, I usually do, but we kind of wrap up a point. I don't want to get into a new point because this will just um, lead us into a direction that I want to make sure that we give enough time to, and I want to make sure that you have the, the, a good attention span to deal with. So I'm going to leave it here for now. Again, thank you for coming out. Thank you for being part. Uh, if you'd share this out there, uh, DM it, email it, whatever, that'd be awesome. Would love you for that. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, my contact's going to pop up at the end of the, ser- the section here. At the end of this session, you can just reach out to me in any way, and I'll do the best I can either to get back to you or to include it in the next session or whatever I can do to help answer a question or continue on the communication. My friends, thank you. God bless you. Thanks for, for tuning in, and we'll talk to you next time.